I want to say thanks to you, Burl, simply because you didn't talk too much. <laughs> a long time ago, I was supposed to introduce a speaker at something much less of a level than this. It was like a group anniversary. It was very important that night, and no lower of a level as it happened, but it wasn't a big shindig like this. And this guy came up to me and said, uh, are you introducing the speaker? I said, yes. And he said, well, remember this. Your job is to open the gate and let the bull out the pasture. If we wanted to hear you, we would have asked you to be the speaker. <laughs> well, I started to tell Burl that earlier, and I said, no, it hurt his feelings. Burl, Burl and I go back a long way, and uh, he spoke not long ago, and he taught me something that I hadn't realized. He was talking about the fact that we went back a long way, and he turned and he said, Jim and I have been together for 30 years off and on, and you know, that's a lifelong friend. And I never knew when I came in here I was going to find a lifelong friend, and the way he said it, it hit me. And for most, most of those years, I, I wouldn't let him teach me very much because I was sober longer than him. <laughs> and this simply beautiful tonight. You know, we sat up there. I kissed him when I came, when he introduced me. And it's a lot of fun here. And uh, everybody is clean. And no matter what arguments went on back in the rooms and at other places, we're acting nice now. <laughs> But see, Burl and I, it hasn't always been like this. So I want to say to the newer people that stood up and then came up here, and regardless uh, of the length of sobriety, the, there's two keys. And the lady mentioned this morning, the first one is to not drink. And, and I believe the second one is that there's a way of life, but we got to keep plugging and plugging. So several times in the early days, like one time over in Salisbury, Burl and I got in an argument which led to a fight almost, which led to him taking off all his, uh, he had a belt full of uh, hammers and screwdrivers and stuff, and uh, and I had a briefcase, and I threw it, and he started unbuckling, and we're in each other's face, and it was, a, it was really a big uh, scene that day over some furniture. We never lost it over anything small. This was over a couch and a, and a divan that he had given to another drunk, and I told him he couldn't do it, and we got into it. We don't just get into stuff, and it's over. He got in a car, because I think he thought he might kill me, and he drove to Florida, and he stayed two weeks. And he would, wouldn't call and tell anybody where he was. I was worried like hell. I learned something uh, like I've heard some Al-Anon people say before that, uh, <clears throat> oh, they would be pacing the floor and walking around and looking out the windows, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and they were just praying that the drunk would get home, and then they'd go down the hall, and the thought process would flip, and they'd say, I hope the son of a gun doesn't even get here. They really said worse than that, but in keeping with the language of the heart, which is one thing entirely, but... Uh, this wonderful committee, and I sincerely mean, I mean, whoever was behind putting all of this thing on, it really, if you are new and if you've been here a while, can realize it's uh, truly a gift what has happened here in the past few days. This is absolutely a, a class act. It's a touching act. It's, a, it's beautiful. But the committee, after they met a few times and they picked the speakers, and I don't know who they had in mind, but I have an idea that I was close to being one of the ones. They send Burl around to tell me that we'll meet you up there and we'll have uh, tickets for you and, and so on. Oh, and there's one other thing. Uh, uh, they, want, they want you, um, uh, they want all the speakers to watch their language. I said, Burl, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I cleaned it up because I'm following instructions. And he said, well, that means just don't talk the way you do out in the parking lot. <laughs> like if you're talking to a new guy or a new gal. 
and it all depends on whatever is proper at the time. I believe in propriety. That's a fancy word. It, it means saying the right thing, doing the right thing under the circumstances. And uh, I do believe in propriety. So he didn't have to tell me that. That irritated me more than anything because it's like, don't they know? I'm uh, so grateful to uh, be in a room where there's a man named Sonny who's sober 51 years. It's an inspiration to me. And if it's not to anybody else here, then I think something that's 51, that's a lot of cups of coffee and riding the meetings and and if you're sober much less time, it's still a lot of cups of coffee and riding the meetings. And then uh, there's people here that are so relatively new. And I know that I personally and I believe we as a group need each and every one of us in order for this thing to keep working. This man over here, this tall man, came up to me doing this countdown. And when it was over, and he said, what do you think? And I have no idea where it came from. But I said to him, you just can't get any closer to God than this. And for that magic few moments that went on a little while ago where there was a lot of fun and a lot of clapping and a lot of uh, just being grateful and just seeing and feeling what goes on and the personal recognition deep down inside too. Uh, it's so fleeting, but it's so wonderful. I don't want to forget those that helped me to get here. There's many a person that touched my life in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that's no longer here. Some were close, some were not so close, but some gave me a message so, so often. On a easier note for a minute, I, uh, I didn't know Sonny was going to be here. I knew Jim over here was here. One of the things that may happen tonight if this goes acceptable by your standards. It's going to be acceptable by my standards. But uh, this fellow Jim that's sober 44 years helped me the first day I was here. And he stood up in a workshop and we were talking about passing it on was a subject and he gently and easily calmly said, if you want to pass it on and you want it to work, then you, you must simply be yourself. And I had a flashback to a sponsor who told me long ago, don't try to be what you think you are. And don't try to be what you want everybody else out there to think you are. You'll strike out. You'll fail. Just be what you are. And uh, it has come slow, and it's coming slow. But I was reminded the other day, anyway, I didn't know Sonny was going to be here. I knew he was going to be here. And I, I said, well, I can come in first tonight. I asked Burl, is it okay if I say I'm sober 46 years? <laughs> well, he knows so much about me. He said, no, where do you get that? And I said, well, I was wondering if we ever are allowed to count the years before we took the first drink. <laughs> and uh, that, that was like around 14. 14 rings a bell. <clears throat> This is the 14th uh, gathering of this conference, and I was a speaker at the first one. That's 13 years ago. That ought to tell somebody around here, including me, something. And uh, at that rate, it means I hope to see you again in like the year 2010 <laughs> in this room. A lady over here today, I don't have to talk about anything really other than what I have experienced at this conference. There was a lady by this door today that said sometimes, I don't know if she was talking about me, she said sometimes I have heard speakers that if you hear them two or three times, you know what's going to happen and what they're going to say. And I said, you don't have to worry about that. I've, I've been accused ever since I've been here. Nobody knows what the hell I'm, what the heck I'm going to say. <laughs> it's the same story, but it, it comes from all different directions. There's not a first part, second part. Our story is disclosed in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. That's so very simple. And uh, I, I, was, I have been touched by every speaker here. And I want to say something about each one of those speakers and how and whatever it has to do with me. <clears throat> this guy sitting here... Uh, you don't have to know the names if you, you can just go along with me. This guy sitting here came 
You know, I sat and listened to him. I don't believe I've heard anybody in a long time that I felt so much alike. One sponsor said one time, we are so very fortunate. We come here and we sit and we listen and we understand. No, 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 we don't understand each other. We comprehend each other. It's a much better word. It's if you are inside the skin of another person. And uh, this guy who came from this gang in Philadelphia, you know, I was inspired by what he said. I understood. Everything is relative. I came from a small town down on the river banks of the Mississippi River, and I was in a gang. We, uh, we stood around outside the drugstore imitating Jimmy Dean and tried to keep guys from the other school away from the drugstore. But I identified with him. Everything is relative. We thought it was a tough group. I appreciate him. I see him often. He has been to my house to eat. I uh, listened to the lady who came from Virginia, and she has been in my life since the first day she asked for help. And in 32 years in this program for me, she gave me, other than sobriety and what I've learned from AA as a whole, she has given me the the greatest gift that I have ever been personally given. That was before Sue came. Sue does not, you don't have to worry. It's not that kind of a gift. (laughs) You will be concerned because I'm not going to tell you what it was. And then uh, that guy, that, uh, that cowboy, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, I certainly understood. I, I don't know that I've ever touched a horse, but I understood. And uh, I talked to him outside uh, or at breakfast and went over and said, you know, I really do appreciate you. And he, he talked about perceptive and it's how we perceive things, and I don't know if I'm right on that doesn't matter but I leaned on and said I didn't know that he talked about anger I didn't know that there was anybody else in this program that was an incredible hulk other than me and uh, I really do appreciate you I uh, spent some years in the paratroopers and I heard him say his submarine had been docked and I said "Uh uh-huh another weirdo And uh, I asked him afterward, I said, oh, you were a submariner? And he said, yeah. He said, you know how you can tell a submariner? And I said, Alan, and he said, well, they're the guys that are dancing together late in the evening. (laughs) When the dance is almost over, I don't know whose this is. I hope it's... (laughs) It, It wasn't water, but it was straight coke. That's okay. No, no, no. You know, about a hundred years ago at these meetings when I was going with my sponsor, I used to wonder, why do those old guys have to drink water and stuff? Is that? I saw one one time take his watch off and look at it and do that, and then later on he said, you know, the watch doesn't work, but it looks good if you take it off and let everybody... <laughs> and I better take it off tonight. I don't know what time it's supposed to be over. Uh, <clears throat> And then that uh, bus driving lady, (laughs) boy, I'll tell you, I could understand her, but I could understand everybody, and uh, I have to be careful what I hear. You know, there's such a part of me that's a little boyish kind of thing, and I have to be careful. She said words to the effect that I could leave here with a dream, and I have some, but I always uh, wondered why I, the Baltimore Orioles haven't called me yet. <laughs> and I went back to the room and I decided to check some football scores and I saw on there where this catcher for the New York Mets has signed a seven-year deal for $91 million. Now, not only do I think things have gone crazy, I said, well, I wonder, 
I have a dream. <laughs> How about just a backup bench warmer for a couple of thousand a year? You know, I want to tell you that that's not far-fetched about the little boy in me. One time, I went to Memphis, Tennessee, and I was about 19 years old, and I heard that the St. Louis Cardinal baseball team was staying at a hotel. So this other guy and I got a little few, bu I think you could stay there for $8 a night, big nights hotel. We pooled our money. I went in and got the room and, and snuck him in. It was $8 for one person. And uh, we went out to see the Cardinals play, and we sat around in the lobby, and not too long went by, and I said, well, you know, we ought to make the best of this. Now, we were drinking, but I was only 19. I wasn't in a lot of trouble. I, uh, I got a sport coat and put it on and stood near the front door, and when kids came along, I said, hey, kid, you want an autograph? What's your name? And I'm signing all these autographs. <laughs> I had one player walk by and say, hey, good to have you. When did you get up here, from double A or what? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> My name is Jim Ray. I write Jamie Doo Doo Doo. Shortstop. So I had a dream a long time ago. It never worked out. <clears throat> I, uh... The other speaker was Sue. And I can, I will only say to you that about 18 years ago when I was confused about some things, it, I went to see my sponsor, one of my sponsors, they're still living, and uh, her name is Louise and she lives in Memphis, Tennessee. And I went to see Louise and I said, Louise, and I told her all this stuff, and she said, now listen to me. You know, it doesn't matter what a sponsor says if we want to be sober, I believe, because if she had told me to do something else, I would have done it. I'm a product today of what my sponsors passed on to me, whatever home groups I went to, whatever the speaker said years ago, whoever hugged me tonight and said, good luck. I'm a product of all these things. She said, you need to uh, go to meetings and quit listening to these people that's been sober a long time. They got you confused. I want you to go to meetings for six months and only listen to the people that had been in AA for a year or less. You need to get back to some basics. <clears throat> so I started listening, and uh, I listened to Sue. <laughs> and one night she asked me to marry her, <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so I have gotten a lot from her, whatever she said here, and at other times also. I, uh, you hear that? I, uh, I grew up in the deep south on the Mississippi River in the state of Mississippi. It was a center of learning. It's just that only the people that are there now or were there long ago like me learned whatever it was that they were putting out and it was not too heavy. I, uh, I learned that, uh, this here, and not, not only the bus driver and the submariner, but the, the gang member from Philadelphia mentioned John Wayne, and I thought I was all alone on that deal until this conference <laughs> has led me to come to the understanding, <clears throat> this is not an AA function, but we have a public affairs, public relations person who needs to get in touch with those that are preventing alcoholism and they need to come out with a primer, John Wayne, what not to do. <laughs> and it might help somebody. In my case, it had to do with them wearing the uniforms, uh, the longest day, uh, the sands of Iwo Jima. I grew up as a product of, uh, during the war years, uh, the early war years, before it started, really, and uh, I was in that center of learning where men Somebody taught me very early that one of the things you must know how to do, you can't just walk in there like you did. You have got to hit that saloon, those two swinging saloon doors, so they pop real loud. And, well, I had seen that in the John Wayne movie, and I learned how to do that. They had these uh, smoke houses. And at a very early age, I started drinking. Before I got there, what happened to me? I was about 14 years old. I worked in a meat market. 
and uh, worked for a guy named, uh, who his name doesn't matter, but he looked like the movie star for you older folks, Ernest Borgnine. And Ernest Borgnine had come out with a movie called Marty, and I worked for the guy that could have been his stand-in. And the guy I worked for was a roustabout kind of guy. He believed in marrying them and leaving them and marrying them again and in between chasing them. And to help him get there, I learned later, he did a whole lot of this. Well, one night he said, hey, Jimmy. I said, yes, sir. He said, go back there and get a couple of six-packs, put them in the cooler. When we close up the night, we'll drink. I'm 16, 15, 14 years old. I don't know till this day. I said, that's a good idea. I need a drink. Never had one in my life. Well, you got to eat your words if you don't watch out. So I go back there and get one of them later on in the evening, go down, crawl up under the building, and drink that. I thought it might taste like olives. It might do. I didn't know if you had. I didn't know. I could have known, I guess. My father was a, had been an alcoholic. My, my mother was at that time. I, I knew about alcoholics. You know, uh, I learned in AA. I thought it was a little funny. Well, if, if they don't say they're alcoholics, they're not so well. Everything's not quite that black and white in my life. I grew up with two of them around. I should have known what it tastes like, but I didn't. So I cultivated the taste, went out there. He said, open this up a bit. I got it. I opened it up. We drank it. I had another one. My nose got numb. My earlobes got numb. I felt warm. And for the first time in my life, I can assure you, I never, I knew this before I got here. I didn't hear anybody else say it. I was full of confidence. Things just didn't, I didn't realize I had been so uptight. I was uptight all my life. I was raised by a, a mother and a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and a great-great-grandmother. Five generations in my house. Thirteen of us sat down at the table when we got ready to eat. All the women, especially the old women, telling me, hold your shoulders up, clean your plate, do this, go brush your teeth. All my life these women were telling me something. <laughs> Not knowing I had a rebellious nature. I didn't know it till I had those beers. Well, anyway... Uh, the second week, we, uh, we had another same ritual. This time I had two beers, maybe three, was headed out of this grocery store, and I looked over, and this cashier looked at me a funny You might understand I'm one of the drunks of the world that I don't like for people to look at me funny. <laughs> he looked, who are you looking at? <laughs> he, he was just seeing me go by. So I walked over and punched him right in the eye. I mean, not a little punch. One of those Philadelphia gang member punches. I punched this guy one. Oh, he was hunting. I walked on out of the store. Sort of a John Wayne walk. I probably could look back and see. And uh, I did enough that day to qualify for this program. My drinking caused me a problem. My drinking caused me remorse. And that night, about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I knocked on his door. His mama opened the door, and she said, yes, she knew me. And I said, I would like to talk to Don. She said, you can go back and see him, but I'm not very happy with your behavior. I went back, sat on the side of the bed, and tried to apologize to this, this young boy, 15, 16 years old. I was awfully sorry for what I did. But I didn't know it was the alcohol. I tell you, years later, I thought it was the way he looked at me. I just overreacted. I still overreact. <clears throat> I uh, had been given a lot of blessings in life. I had be been given a, a whole ball of wax full of lots of different things. I uh, had an alcoholic mother who, by the way, was in and out of this program for about 35 years and died drunk from an old overdose of uh, prescription drugs and alcohol. Sue and I were the first ones in the house in, uh, to clean the place up. So I know something about living with it, and I know something about the tragic end. I uh, was raised by those people 
that I think they loved me as best they could. I don't get too bogged down with all this stuff today that I hear and see on TV. The society changed. To me, it was normal that if one of those great-grandmothers, not the great-great when she was a little old, she only demanded that you listen to a, the Holy Bible every afternoon and a, and a story from the, the, the children's uh, Bible stories every afternoon, sitting at attention. And, uh, but the other one believed that the, all punishments, no matter what, was, was to be locked in the closet for a while. So I grew up just thinking, well, you just get locked in the closet if you do anything. I have a hard time today understanding some things about myself, so I don't try to understand everything about you anymore. I, uh, I could never leave the table unless the plate was clean. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something, and ladies, guys and gals, that uh, they, these 13 people would sit down, and they serve, and everybody passes, and they fix the plate, and we'd eat. And when you got through, you could leave, but not if you were a child. You could not leave until the plate was finished. And uh, I want you to know that the other kids in the family did theirs kind of okay. They would piddle around for a little while. And, uh, but I would sit there, and I would sit there. All 13 people would come back for the next meal, but I didn't get a clean plate until I finished this one. You can eat some stuff that goes bad in four or five hours. So I really didn't like them. I didn't like all those people. And I drank that couple of beers there on those Saturday nights and things got better. I never did this before. Does it look cool? It, it... Man. Oh, but I was going to tell you what happens. I used to sit back there and say, what the hell do these people do up to all that drinking that stuff up there? Not, don't they know this wasting time? Years go by and I'm older. There's not as much saliva. I understood this lady today. There's not as much saliva today. You get dried out. And you... yeah. Man, I used to could talk two, three hours and not repeat myself. And uh, I didn't eat anything today. So I'm glad somebody left a Coca-Cola up here. It works. I want you to know I had some opportunities. I'm going to get to the crux of the matter. I became a rip-roaring, I hope the committee will accept, raunchy. I was a raunchy, raunchy-ass drunk, I'm going to tell you. Now, I had the opportunities, and I had some upbringing, and uh, my, my dad had gotten killed in uh, World War II. Uh, he, had, uh, he had left me with some things that I, I think about now and then. I, I'm still in this great search for what is manhood, but I want to tell you I know a lot more about it today. Uh, but uh, this guy would come home drunk. I know what an alcoholic is. I wouldn't have to wait for him to say. This guy would come home drunk, and he... First, he would announce nobody needed to cook for him. He could eat the meat raw. And he'd chew up this steak. He was a wild man. Maybe that's where I learned some of this behavior. But then every now and then he'd say, come here. Little boys don't cry. Men don't cry. Now, you stand there. And he'd hit me one so hard in the stomach, I want to tell you, I better not cry. So I grew up with some harsh kind of stuff, which I don't think has anything to do with me taking a drink of alcohol and something feeling good and then always searching for that same feeling but other things happening and that, that good feeling not coming back. I don't think any of that happened, but it has something to do with about my fears and my not knowing about what life is really all about. And Well, anyway, I had some breaks. My mama married a man who was my stepfather for about 30 years who was a member of Al-Anon. And uh, I think he's one of the best men that I ever knew in my life, who I'm not sure ever saw a John Wayne movie. <laughs> this guy was just absolutely beautiful. Would probably be the smallest man in the room, would be the quietest man in this room tonight, would be the gentlest man. And my mother gave him fits. Oh, my goodness, she gave him fits. One night I said, what the hell happened? What the heck happened this time? <laughs> he said, well, we went to a meeting. And they had a speaker down there who said, I've been sober 14 years. And, for, and on January the 1st, 14 years ago, somebody had given me a bottle of booze. 
And I said it, and I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and I said, there it is. Do I want to drink that, or I want to leave it in that bottle? He said, I made a decision not to open that bottle. I called AA. He said, I came to AA. That bottle is still sitting on my dresser. And every morning I wake up and I say, do I want to open that bottle? No, I don't. I want to stay sober. Well, riding home, my mama says, George, that's the most beautiful story I ever heard. That's what we need to do. We need to get a bottle and put it on my dresser. (laughs) My stepdaddy said, you think so? Okay. And he pulls in the package store and uh, he gets one and they set it and they have a little ceremony and everything and he tells me the next day I'll be damned four o'clock in the morning the bottle fell out of the bed and rolled across and she got up to go to the bathroom and fell down I'll be damned I said George I told you you can't trust her she's good I should have known we shanghaied her anyway the stepdaddy of mine said I'll help you go to school I'll help you go to to college and uh, he did and I went off to school, and I meanwhile was drinking. I had an opportunity to play football at that institution, and, and I had learned that if you do that, you got to give up. Uh, you, you can't go drink beer all the time. So uh, I had already been in trouble at high school. I had already been in trouble uh, where I worked at summer jobs. I had already stood before a judge, and uh, if it hadn't been for a football coach, I would have I been really in trouble. And, uh, but I had an opportunity, not o- only at that school, but, but other schools. And, uh, but for the power of alcohol, I can say, there go I sometimes when I see some other people that have done some things. I was told by several football coaches, for a small guy and for a guy that hasn't had any more than you've been given, you are the finest offensive blocking lineman I have ever seen in my life. From a guy who's a, nationally known football coach. I said, yeah, well, that didn't mean anything to me. Truthfully, nothing ever really meant anything to me. All the breaks I was given, they, I took them for granted. I took life for granted. And as I drank, I, I developed a bunch of these, these isms came out. I mean, this was really my world. You know, I took what I wanted. It didn't matter to me. I began to change. The worst came out because I knew I was a kind, giving I had always been a, my mother told me one time, she said, you were the sweetest little boy. You were always sad, but you were so sweet. You were a good boy. You helped me. When my daddy was killed, she was 24 years old with three kids. That didn't mean anything to me then, but it does today. Gee, I look at people that got kids, and I can see what they have to deal with. Well, once I started drinking, I rebelled against her and all her mamas and grandmamas and the four generations ahead of me, and then it was Katie bar the door. There was no man around, and George, that gentle giant, rip snorting, Superman comes home. I would say, George, I'm going to go out for a while. Do you need anything, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Do you have two dollars? Let me tell you, two dollars. Beer was fifteen cents a bottle. You figure it out. <laughs> Twelve bottles later, plus whatever else I conned out of somebody, I'd come home. Get out of the way. I'd come down the hall. He'd say something. I'd knock a hole in the wall. This is before things got bad. He was glad to see me go off to school. I went off to school. I got into trouble. But in those days, you had to uh, be in the ROTC if you went to a state institution. So I went, and two years went by. By that time, I had been asked to leave classes and not come back. I never did go back to certain classes. I didn't know what happened. I would start drinking. Wake up in class. Sometimes I wake up and everybody's gone. Professor said, we just decided to let you sleep this time. By the way, don't come back. I didn't know what happened. You know, I know about being defenseless drunk. I never wanted any of those things in my life to happen. I wanted something much better with my life. Anyway, two years went by, so I stayed two more. And I went into this advanced ROTC, by the way, which I had to go to summer school to stay in, and then I had to go part of another year. But I finally graduated with two degrees and a commission making me a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And I want you to know I loved the military very much. I was very good in what I did. I wanted it. I volunteered and I was chosen for the field of intelligence. I became the equivalent to the civilian FBI agent. 
I spent three years in the 82nd Airborne Division. I had a tremendous mind. I was given a top secret clearance. I was put in a room and I memorized everything that was possible to know in one head about the island of Cuba because Mr. Castro was a, see, I want to say a-hole so bad. He was, a, he was acting up. That's progress, gang. He was acting up and the guy said, here's your job. You come in every day and we lock you in this place and you start. We want temperatures, names of leaders, the elevation, when the tides change, how many soldiers they got, the names of them, how long it takes to get from here, everything. I did that for two years in case the two-star general wanted a briefing. And he'd come in, I'd stand out, what do you need, sir? And he'd ask me and I'd tell him. Oh, I'll tell you, it was a good, I had every break. That's a good break for a young man in our society today. Backfired. He's coming out of the club one night from some party, and I'd been over there since happy hour. And I saw him, and I can't tell you what I said, but it is the language of the heart. <laughs> I said something like, you little bastard, come here. <laughs> two-star general, anybody in the military, the Navy, two-star admiral, grabbed him around the neck, and I said, hey, we got 12, 14,000 guys with us. We don't need any of them. You want to kick Mr. Cuba's, uh, Mr. Castro's rear end? Me and you can go. Are you in shape? What have you been doing lately? <laughs> the guy's looking at me. It was a mess. MPs got me and away I am. Well, he really wasn't the swiftest guy in the world. Plus, when I clean up, I clean up pretty good. Well, about two, three weeks later, they had things got hot and they had a briefing for this guy. And they had like six people in the room. I was one of them. But the other four, he was there, and the other four were also very big shots, and I was sitting back over here in case. And I tell you guys and gals, <clears throat> he was sitting there listening. Now, he's ready to take the 82nd Airborne into Cuba. It's, it's hot time in the old time, town tonight. He's sitting there listening, and he turned around to see who was in the room. He turned around, and I could see the wheels. And he did it real fast, and he turned around, and he, he didn't hear anything else. He was saying, where do I know that? Where do I know this? I was saved once again. I spent a lot of time reporting to certain offices and to colonels knocking on the door, going in and saying, sir, I'd like to apologize for my behavior last night. Most times I had no idea what the behavior was. The first time they told me, you insulted his wife. You told him that she didn't look like she was worth going to bed with. You almost hit him. This is a full colonel in the army at a nice function like this. So I went down there, knocked on the door, went in and reported. Said, sir, I'm sorry for what I did. He said some things. They probably say, you know, he's a hell of a good soldier, but... We got to do something about his drinking. Maybe he can drink like a man. Maybe he can drink like John Wayne. That was their attitude. Well, anyway, it got to the point where they just say, "Hey, at ten o'clock, you're on in room three oh six. Just apologize. We don't have to tell you what you did. Just work it out." I go in. This colonel says to me, uh, "Young man, I want to tell you something. You're a very good soldier. You come to my house." And you have a few more drinks. You already had some when you got there. And you announced to all my guests that you, uh, you could really run the office better than me. That's okay. You get very handsome when you drink. You cute. You pinch my wife on the rear end. I'm going to let that go, but it's really not acceptable. You announce, as you pick up the punch bowl, that you can now drink everybody here. And you chug a lug out of my punch bowl. <laughs> Spilled stuff all over my floor. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry, Colonel. I, so help me. I don't remember being at the man's house. I'm standing there saying, if they got me mixed up, I didn't. But I want you to know, young man, you crossing the line. You grabbed me around the throat and had me back there choking me, threatening to kill me. So, you know, I knew I was in trouble. I drank for about ten more years. They'd send me on operations. I'd go to the wrong town. I stopped the policeman, uh, Mike, 
to stop the policeman out in Denver, Colorado one time, stumbling along there about 10 o'clock at night, snow on the place. And I say, hey, excuse me, officer. He said, yes. And uh, <clears throat> I said, where's this hotel? Showed him a key. I said, where's this hotel? I don't know. What kind of cop are you? <laughs> You'll spend your life walking a beat. You don't know where the hotel is. He said, hey, 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 you want this billy stick right up your mouth? I said, wait, what's the matter with you? He said, hey, you answer me where the hotel is. I said, yeah, you don't know. He said, right, this is Denver, Colorado. That hotel's in P Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> For the guys that don't understand some of this or haven't reached the point about we all can, can admit to and say we have an illness and there's a way out, don't, uh, don't be too harsh on what any of the speakers have to say. The job is to see where we can identify with some things, not whether we have a parallel story. Some guys uh, misinterpret. They say, well, gee, he went to college. What does he know about drinking? I'm going to tell you, I know about asking the cop certain things. I know about going too far and the guy hitting me with a billy stick. I know about going in a paddy wagon. I know about going in and getting fingerprinted. I know about having a piece of paper in my wallet that when I got arrested and taken in, at some point, if I couldn't get out of it, I could pull this wallet out and flip this piece of paper and they'd read it and go make a phone call and everything was dropped and somebody picked me up at the back door and I was taken away in the hours of darkness because I was very good at what I did. I was highly trained and they depended on me. They liked me. He's one of the best men we have. He'll also give you anything you ask him. He'll give you the shirt off his back. See, I told you I had some good things. <laughs> but if he's been drinking, stay the hell away from him. He's trouble. <laughs> and I was trouble. So I drank for some more years. I eventually ended up doing lots of things. You know the story. Ended up in Walter Reed Army General Hospital, the closed psychiatric ward. After a time, I was told, you know, we're going to let you out of here and you'll be dead within 30 days. You'll either be back with us or you'll die in the streets. You haven't got a chance. You're a hopeless alcoholic. I was told that. But they didn't know what to do. AA wasn't in the hospitals yet. It was a long time ago. But there was a guy there, a psychiatrist, and uh, he waited outside, and he said to me, <clears throat> I believe, I'm making it short, I believe that you have everything deep down inside of yourself. I challenge you to think about that if you are new. One of those wonderful guys that had been here a day, two days, a week, two weeks. He said to me, I believe you have everything deep down inside of yourself to face the realities of life without drinking if you learn how to not drink. The Army doesn't uh, recommend this, but I do because as a young intern, I saw the results of Alcoholics Anonymous and they have the answer for you if you want to be sober. Why don't you give yourself a break and call them? Why don't you give yourself a break and call them? No matter how long you've been here, we have an illness. Why don't you give yourself a break and keep coming back? Jimmy, I'm giving myself a break. It matters not what you think of me. It matters not. I'm the one who dies if I drink again. I'm the one who goes to bed sober and has all these pleasant memories if I give myself a break. Or the lady hit the jackpot today. It's all in my thinking. And I'm here tonight because of so many people that passed this message on to me. I left that hospital. They threw me out, to tell you the truth, but I left. <laughs> and uh, I called Alcoholics Anonymous because a patient who had had a relapse came in, and he had a world directory. And to make the story short, he gave me a number, and I called the number. I understand about the love of God. I don't know about everybody else. This is what happened to me. I called the number. The lady answered the phone. I said, is Larry there? She said, no, he hasn't come in from work. May I help you? And I said, I'm going to give you my number. Would you have him call me? Because I can't make this phone call again. She took the number and I hung up. And I've thought over the years, thank God he didn't say, well, if he wants what we got, he'll call again. <laughs> this guy Larry called. He said, what's your address? He came to my house. He walked up the walk. I lived over in Glen Burnie, a drunk's house. 
punch the screen out to reach in and unlock it. <laughs> you kick the bottom out. Things need painting. One car won't run. Grass not cut. Everybody scattered when I hit the front door. Everybody scattered. And uh, anyway, Larry came up. I'm watching him. <clears throat> he uh, walked up the walk and he said, uh, why don't you open the door and let me in? I want you to take a look at a real drunk. I had never heard anybody talk that way. That got me right then. I had never heard anybody say, let take a look at a real drunk. He came in, he sat down 25, 30 minutes, told me the story of his life, which, by the way, did not parallel mine. But he told me the story of his life and how drinking had hurt his life and what he had found. And he said, would you like to go to a meeting? And I said, yes. Larry, I need about three weeks. He said, what for? I said, I got to find my clothes. I got to see if I got a job back. The Army had already told me, don't come back. I mean, I was in the jackpot. He said, the way this program works is you call. We make a call on you. We talk about what we do, and we go to a meeting that night. He looked at his watch. He said, the meeting starts at 830. I I'll be back to get you about 8 o'clock, and by that time, he was going down the street. And the truth of the matter, I stood out there, and I said, well, that son of a gun is coming back to this house. You kind of lose some of the context, don't you? <laughs> That's what happened. He came back, we went. Now, I'm a young captain in the Army, a drunken bum, back from Vietnam. Oh, what a mess that was. What a mess that was. That We don't have time. It's not important. It was bad. I do want to tell you, I have to watch myself, my thinking. So many of the people from my hometown area, my home group members, there are several of them here tonight, and there are, others, there are some that are saying, why the hell did we pay? We can hear him run his mouth over in Pittsville or wherever. <clears throat> I, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that they're all here. I, uh, I better move on. But I do want to tell you that uh, for years I served in the military, some elite units at time, and, and they didn't know my name was Jim. My name was Barf. Barf. Somebody here that's new ought to know what Barf means. <laughs> I didn't. Now, I'm in a place that's a pretty, high, pretty, you know, a pretty high-level guy, and, I mean place, and I'm over there, and here comes an Army colonel, and they escort him in, and they say, uh, Colonel, have you met Barf? <laughs> I jump up and say, How are you, sir? He says, Good to see you, Barf. What you got going? <laughs> that was because I... So I asked a guy. I didn't know what it meant. Two college degrees, and did it a lot of places. I didn't know what it meant. I asked this guy, I said, why do they call me Barth? He said, you don't know? I said, I don't know where it came from. He said, because you vomit all the time. You vomit in the Jeep. You vomit in the nightclub. You vomit in the bathroom. You vomit in the bed. You just vomit. <laughs> Those guys are somewhere. You, you know, it's so wonderful. I met a guy at a function, similar to this, but not an AA function. Now, we're talking, and I can... We separated. I said, I got to go find him. Went and found him. I said, I know you from somewhere. He said, oh, I don't believe so. You ever live? And he named some places. I said, no. He said, I said but I just know you. We kept He said, I can't. Uh... I said, Jim, no. So we were leaving. I said, well, wait a minute. Were you ever in the military? He said, oh, yeah. I said, were you ever in Vietnam? He said, oh, yeah. We got down to the years, and oh, well, lo and behold, I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Barth Mallory, he said, oh, son of a gun. <laughs> we had been out one time, one night, with a mutual guy got us together, and we, we, we were in Saigon. <laughs> Believe me, 16 years had gone by. He never knew my name. Larry came back, we went to a meeting. And we got to the meeting, and we were the first ones there, except a guy was in the back. I want to tell you about the power of example. We certainly don't have time to go through all these steps for me to tell you about every meeting I ever been to or what every sponsor ever told me. I had wonderful sponsors. We're very close because we had one of the same sponsors, Earl and I. <clears throat> Mr. 
man came out of the kitchen because Larry, who took me, said, Hey, Ken, we got a, guy, we got a new guy. And I didn't know what was going on. And here comes a new guy. Now, this was in 1966, June, hot weather, Jumpers Hole Road, the Glen Burnie area. And this guy came out of the kitchen named Ken, and he had on a white shirt. I think he was an older man, probably younger than I am now, but an older man. And he had on a white shirt that I think had been starched. And uh, as he came towards me, he was rolling his sleeves down. And he buttoned them, very gentlemanly-like guy, which I am myself. <laughs> Only when I drink, it be, something becomes undone. <laughs> and uh, I already told you what I was, a raunchy person. And uh, wake up anywhere and everywhere. You did get me to start thinking uh, about who and where and when. <laughs> <laughs> Self-will run riot. Went on a combat operation one time, a whole big outfit operating. And uh, I was one of the American advisors going. And uh, the only thing, it was starting like 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, 9 o'clock at night, I went and got the interpreter. And we went, I said, hey, we're going to go and have a couple of beers because we're going to be out there a few days. I always had a couple of beers and got lost. And uh, <clears throat> we had a couple of beers and a couple of more and a couple of more and a couple of more. Next thing I know is like, one o'clock in the morning, I said, come on, we're going. He said, we, we can't even get out of town. They got roadblocks. I said, hey, man, I'm the driver. You just get in the vehicle. And uh, the self-will run riot under the influence. And away we went, ran through a couple of these things, hit the roadblocks, knocked them over. No telling what we did. Got to a place, and he said, hey, I've been trying to tell you. I said, I don't want to hear from you. He said, sir, I've been trying. I said, I don't want to hear from you. I'm the boss. We're here. So we got out to this place, and... Uh, I said, hey, there's nobody here. There's supposed to be 500 people. 500 South Vietnamese soldiers and a couple of other outfits are supposed to be here. Well, what's going on? He said, I've been trying to tell you. We're supposed to meet him at 5 in the morning. It's 2 o'clock. We're three hours early. I said, well, where are we? He said, we're in a no man's land again. I said, yeah, well, let me tell you your job. You better not let anybody hurt me. I'm going to sleep, not through the... That's cool. That's really cool. That, that's neat. The next morning, 500 Vietnamese soldiers standing over about 100 yards away laughing their rear ends off at the big dumb American done showed up again. The guy rolled his sleeves down. He came over. He said, my name is Ken. I'm so glad you're here. You'll excuse me, please. <clears throat> I'm making a coffee this month, and I have to go back to the kitchen. I said, yes, he turned, rolled his sleeves back up, went to the kitchen. I don't know so much about all the anonymity in the world that transpires or how it all is supposed to be interpreted. Larry leaned over and said, well, I just want you to know he's an admiral in the Navy. And I thought to myself, well, there's not too many admirals in the world, and if this outfit will let him make coffee, there's 50,000 guys like me. If they will let him in here, maybe there's hope for me. And I believe the power of his, that's all the man ever said to me. That very first meeting, a very powerful woman came walking across the room. I can see her. Never seen her since. She came walking across the room and she said, Hi, my name's Mary. What is your name? How's that for taking charge? The drunk wasn't in charge. I love what Sue says about that. She said, Hi, my name is Mary. What's your name? I said, Jimmy. She said, Jimmy. We're a group of people that don't have to drink in order to face life or enjoy life. I hope you'll keep coming back. And she turned and walked away. And I watched her. And I wasn't watching rear end or anything else. I was watching a sober gal who obviously, as I look back, knew where she had been, knew where she had come from, knew what she had found. And more importantly, more than I ever, ever had in my life, she knew where she was going. Yes, I was a guy that was able to say, I must have this thing. I read it in the big book. I must have this thing. Oh, a lot of stories about things that have happened. A lot of stories about sobriety. A lot of stories about what happens to one when you're sober in this program. Or if you don't get sober in this program, all these other people have these things too. Major surgery in my life. 13 years in AA, divorced. 
fist fights with kids, people moving out, losing jobs. Lord help me. I done reached more bottom since I got sober than a lot of people have there before they ever got here. <laughs> got fired. Real quickly, I want to tell you about some things that happened to me. One day after, with now three college degrees and some big jobs in my life, and I got fired, and I end up down in Florida, still sober, and I'm cutting grass for a living. Because I learned something about it. I didn't want to go on a, a, a unemployment check in my case because I could do some work. So I'm cutting grass, hard work. Hard work for a 46-year-old guy in the sun down there. And uh, I saw a recruiting station. And in this recruiting station, they had Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, Coast Guard, a big, nice bill. And I said, well, you know, I think I'll go over there. I used to be in the Army. Maybe they got a bumper sticker that said, I used to be a soldier, whatever. Give me a fountain pen. <laughs> so I go in this place, and this guy jumps up because uh, I was scary. I was an old man at a recruiter station. The circuit, I he thought I was chasing down one of my kids, I think, and uh, I said, no, he said, uh, well, uh, somebody, let me get Mr. So-and-so to talk to you now. Uh, did you, did you want to enlist? I said, oh, you mean to tell me that somebody can come in here and join up? He said, well, you have to talk. So a guy came to see me. I said, hey, I'm 46 years old, almost 47 years old. He said, yes, but you had 13 years before. As long as you can get a total of 20 years in before you're 60, you can come back in. The greatest thing happened to me. I went back in. I went back in as a low-ranking sergeant for nine years, busted my rear end, had to start all over, three or four physical. It was good. It was good. Went to the station where they swear you in. That's great. Forty-seven years old. Fifty-seven, eighteen-year-olds in there. <laughs> we got a Mr. Cool Marine Sergeant over here who, who thinks people like us don't know much. So he decides he's going to hit on my wife. She's standing over there so proud because I'm, I'm going to do something. I wanted to give a day back. What motivated me? Why don't you try to give a day back for all the years you were drunk in the military? That's what really moved me that day when the guy, I thought it over. We talked. It wasn't all as quick as I'm making it sound. He said to her, how you doing, ma'am? Which one of those are your son? And she said, the one with the bald head back over there in the back. In those days, I shaved my head, you know. And uh, he, he looked at her, and he looked at me, and he just walked away. She never had any more trouble. He didn't know what to say. I joined. I went back in. I eventually was asked, do you want to go active duty? I went active duty. And I stayed 11 years. And I retired two years ago. I had an impact. I gave more than a day back because I was sober in this program. I, uh, I had a very good time. I had uh, general officers, two-star generals, come up and say, uh, Sergeant Mallory, are you busy? No, sir. <laughs> no, sir, of course not. Come in and close the door. I want to talk to you for a little while. What do you think about this, that, and the other? I was highly respected. I, I, I had the greatest job in the world. I worked hard. And uh, the day that I retired, it wasn't this many people, but the day that I retired, <clears throat> there were a whole lot of young soldiers stretched from here to yonder that lined up to shake my hand. You know, when Burl introduced me, I kissed him. Two-star general came, came in to see me, and we shook hands, and I kissed him. That never happened to him in his life. He'll never forget as long as he lives. <laughs> Whenever he's socializing, whenever he's socializing, he's going to say, you know, a sergeant kissed me one time <laughs> on the day he left. A.A. Hey, hey, just, I want to tell you that uh, I have been sober since the day I came. I have a, had a wonderful sponsor that uh, told me that sobriety was a, a desire to not want to drink, to not pick up a drink, to want to be sober more than anything in the world, certainly to want to be sober that day more than to, to drink. And uh, it's always been that way. I am an incredible hulk at times. I have made some mistakes. Uh, I don't even know for sure that if they're really mistakes. Maybe that's just the only way I'll ever learn. 
Uh, I will close with a kind of a funny thing, and then I'm going to finish up with uh, something a little more serious. I appreciate your time tonight. You have helped me. Several people have looked at their watch to see what time it is. <laughs> but they won't do it again. They're afraid I'll see them the second time. <laughs> I was sober 20-something years, 25, whatever. Sue, my wife, who when she came to this program, she looked like the wife of Frankenstein. If you ever saw that movie, that little jerky, you know, with the hair and... She was awful, weighed 92 pounds. I wouldn't talk to her until that Louise told me to start listening to the new people. And uh, she, uh, I, I, just, I just stayed away from her. And uh, we got married. Some said, yes, she ended up marrying Frankenstein, so now what are you going to say? Well, anyway, she doesn't know anything about the poor girl never was in the military. Lord help me, I learn every day. I, I got all my stuff. I used to say, oh, I'm a perfectionist, and, you're not, and they want you to do something about that. Well, then I heard, uh, uh, I said, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm just a neat freak. See, that can rationalize it away. Well, I'm a neat freak. Deep, deep in my soul, you must be able to find everything you own in pitch black dark. Now, how's that for some great thinking? And it all should be lined just like this. My previous family, I was sober eight, ten years, and they know about all the lights going on in the house and everybody falling out like the great Santini has returned, and I want to know where my fountain pen is. It's supposed to be right here. Gosh, I got kids going, huh, what? My ex doesn't know what to do, didn't know what to do. Well, today I live with Sue, and I have really had to learn. She don't know about a place for anything, hardly. <laughs> Look, maybe somebody understands this. Maybe it's an ism. The hell with maybe. It's, it's what I live with and deal with. I, got, I brought my, I said, I'll bring the toothpaste, which is a nice long tube that squeezed out and nice. And <clears throat> She's been using it. She thinks, she learned, you pick it up and go, Thanks. Drip, drip, drip all over. I mean, I can go up there tonight and just take the toothbrush and pick up the dripping thing. <laughs> I got to do something about what I used to do. She can't lock doors. God almighty, goodness gracious, she can't lock doors. So a few years ago, I said, all the doors are locked. She said, everything's locked. Poor girl was never in the military. Didn't learn about security, I reckon. I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, it's funny now. Oh, thank God my sponsor said the things that become overwhelming in your life, just devastating. Yes, yes, the day will come. You can look back at them, and like the snap of a finger, they're gone. And yes, you can even laugh at them. Well, anyway, I went down the hall and tried to check the front door and pull it, and it's open. Holy smokes. Been to a meeting similar to this and talked about God's grace and spirituality. And <laughs> well, I'm not going to give you a demonstration, but I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to leave out the expletives. I march in there and I tell Sue, God dang it, you want to know about, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to invite the whole world in to rape us and kill us. <laughs> Off come the clothes. Go get the Army 45. Now look, I'm 27, 20, the Army 45, locked and loaded. <laughs> open up the front door, hook the screen so it's open, walk out buck naked with the weapon. <laughs> to the top of my lungs saying, all right, all you SOBs that want to come rob us, just line up and get the hell in here. She suffers. She's the only one really suffers in my life today. <laughs> the poor girl didn't deserve that. Oh, she gets scared. She don't know if the gun will go off or if I'll... But anyway, so hey, I rationalize. A couple of days of remorse go by, and I'm saying, you know, I think maybe the police like that. If they can get a guy in every neighborhood to do that... The bad guys will be so scared they won't come. 
Thank goodness I can rationalize enough to help me get through to another day. Oh, thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. I must close. I must close. But let me say that uh, my message today is I try to live it. I, uh, first of all, uh, I believe that it's, uh, it's living, it's doing, it's passing it on, it's 12 steps, it's big book, it's, it's AA meetings, it's, uh, it, it's staying close to Burl, it's staying close to other people that are trying to do the same thing I'm trying to do, it's not drinking today, it's learning to have patience with myself and with other people, it's just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things. If you are new here, you leave, and the next two days you walk down the street and you see a bar. That stands for beware, alcohol, run. <laughs> any gimmick, any gimmick. And what my message is today, I'm a guy that's full of love. Yeah, I don't always watch my language. And I don't always sit around Mr. Serenity. Oh, and I like this deli. She's sober a year today, and uh, <clears throat> she's in my home group, and we let her make the coffee up few months there and then we uh, somebody else's turn but she still went over early to see if they do it right and one of them's not doing it right and she's back there in the kitchen and she's telling them how to make coffee she's not even sober a year yet but she's doing that job perfect and they standing there doing this <laughs> what I have to do is stay out of the way because I want to tell her how to tell them how to do it <laughs> a lot of wonderful things have happened to me since I've been sober Lots of wonderful things, lots of difficult things, lots of difficult things. You get fired from a job, you've been there a long time, and you didn't know it was coming, that hurts. You get a divorce, and even though you know it was coming, it hurts. You have a hemorrhoidectomy, and it hurts. <laughs> we got to learn, and we got to be gentle, and we got to love each other, I believe. I'm sitting at a meeting down in Atlanta, Georgia, like this. One of these nice ladies, sober, I don't know how long, maybe not long, I don't know. She comes over and she says, smile. We smile when we get sober. <laughs> I said, I'm sober. What step are you working on? I said, well, the truth, of, I, you know, I didn't want to. I, I changed my ways. I said, the truth of the matter is, lady, I got a hemorrhoid. <laughs> the size of a golf ball and I'm sitting on it <laughs> 12 steps are wonderful the hemorrhoidectomy did more for me than the first three steps about me physically feeling better in summary not only do I have a people from my home group and other people and people in this room that helped me to get sober that I hadn't seen in a long, long time. But uh, just before the meeting started, a, a young man came over and uh, is uh, <clears throat> at normal meetings back in our home group territories and all. It's, it's Jim and, and Miles, but uh, tonight he's my son. And uh, he came over and, oh, what a drunk a log that guy's got. He came over a mess. He came over tonight and put his arm around me and he said, Dad, I know it's going to be a few more minutes, but I just want to tell you that uh, I'll be sitting here at the meeting and I want you to know that, that I love you. And we don't get any closer to God than that. I don't believe wherever I go in search I get any closer to God than that. If I have the opportunity to talk to a new person in the very near future, at my kitchen table after a meeting, and simply, hopefully, one who wants what we have, and I'm able to sit there and try to pass it on, I have learned in my life I can never get any closer to God than that. This lady, Jennifer, touched me the other day, as well as so many in the workshops and so on. I lived the way she described. As she said, she tried to live it. I tried to live it. I will get up uh, pretty soon in my hometown, Berlin, Maryland, and I will walk the streets. And when I leave the town and go to other streets, you, if you see, will see a guy who, if he's not in the Incredible Hulk mode, 
you will see a guy who believes sincerely in my soul that I'm one of the nicest guys in my county. As some say, I'm, I got to watch my judgment. I am in the top ten, I guarantee you. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I try to, uh, if somebody were to say, that guy's in AA, I want them to see a good, I want to see a result, good results from my big book. I truly love mankind and womankind. I truly, you know, Sue, she gets irritated. She says, God, we're going to miss the movie. You talk to the popcorn, popcorn girl for 15 minutes. <laughs> I, I believe whether whoever crosses the path of my life, I try to, I try to be the, what I always wanted, which is very simply this. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that sick and suffering alcoholic who wasn't drinking for a short period of time, I always leaned against the wall and watched the rest of you. And my sponsor came over one night and he said, how you doing? I said, I'm sober. I said, I'm not drinking. He said, yeah, well, how you doing? I said, I ain't drinking. He said, you know, Jimmy, I believe that if you postpone that drink a day at a time, and if you keep coming to these meetings, that one day when somebody asks you that question, you won't say, I'm not drinking. You will say, I'm staying sober. You will slowly turn and start going in another direction from whence you have come. You will change. Yes, I'm going to tell you something. I believe that you will become a decent human being. And he touched my soul. I want to be sober. I want to do what we say that we try to do. But I have been so blessed because I'm going to walk over and sit down. And you can say to yourself or you can forget about it. There goes one decent human being. And that's what you have given me, and that's what I always wanted. May God bless each and every one of us, and thank you.